When you're watching a movie with a hacking scene, and the nerd with the big glasses and hoodie over his head is slamming on the keyboard to break into the mainframe, and eventually says, I'm in. What they're most likely doing is getting what is called a shell on the target computer. A shell is a command line interface, like Command Prompt or Linux Terminal, that allows you to type commands on a computer over a network. You're essentially opening CMD or Terminal on the target computer that you can access from your own computer. Getting a fully interactive shell is the holy grail of exploit payloads, because it means we have full remote code execution, or RCE, on our target computer. This, paired with escalating our privileges to an administrator or root user, means we have full control of the machine and can do whatever we want to it. In this video, I'll cover everything you need to know about basic computer shells, including the difference between a bind, reverse, and web shell, as well as show examples on how we can create these different shells for Windows, Linux, and also some universal shells. I will also cover how we can use Metasploit to select the right shell as our payload, or how we can generate our own shells using MSF Venom. Let's start by explaining the difference between the three main types of shells. When deciding on a shell payload, we have three main types of shells to consider. Those types are bind shells, reverse shells, and web shells. A bind shell requires you to set up a listener on the computer you are targeting. The listener will open a port of your choice and listens for any incoming connections. This is also known as a backdoor. When you make a specific request to the listener port, you'll set up a connection to the target computer to be able to send commands to the target and receive the command output. For example, if we're targeting a Linux computer with Netcat installed, we can use this bind shell to start listening on the target's IP address of 192.168.1.104 over port 7777. All this command is doing is first removing a file in tempf, and then creating that same file as a pipe. It's going to read that file and execute any commands in a terminal, and the output from those commands is going to be piped to the netcat listener, where all of that output gets saved to the tempf pipe as well, and the cycle repeats. Once we hit enter, the listener starts up, and from our Kali machine, we can then connect to that listener by using netcat and specifying the IP address and port of the listening target. Once we hit enter, we see that we have a shell on our Ubuntu target, and we can now type any commands that the Raichu user has access to. For example, we can type ls to list the current directory, and cat out this hello.txt file to show that we can read it. If our target is a Windows computer, we can set up our bind shell listener using PowerShell with the following one-liner script. I've broken out the one-liner into multiple different lines so it's a bit easier to read. And from this script, we see that we're setting up a TCP listener on port 4444. And once a connection is established, the listener will infinitely wait for the attacker to input commands. And those commands will be ran on the Windows system via the invoke expression command. And then all output gets sent back to the attacker. So let's go ahead and run this one-liner bind shell. And then back on our Kali machine, we can connect to that bind shell by typing in the IP address of our Windows target and the port that we use to set up the listener, in our case, 4444. After we hit enter, we see that our connection was established, and we can start typing Windows commands in our terminal. If we type dir, we see that we list the user's Windows directory. We can cd onto the desktop and list that as well. And we can see all of the files that this Windows user has on their desktop. No matter what operating system your target is running, if the machine has Python installed, we can use a one-liner Python script like this one to start a bind shell listener on port 8002. This Python 3 bind shell can be created using the reverse shell generator from revshells.com. All you have to do is give it the IP address of the listener, the port you want to listen on, and then select the Python 3 bind option. And then you can copy this Python 3 one-liner and paste it onto your Linux or Windows target and hit enter. Then from your Kali machine, you can connect to that bind listener by using netcat and specifying the IP address and port that the listener is listening on. Once you hit enter, you should see that we have a connection. We can type ls to list out the directory that we're currently in. pwd will tell us our present working directory and typing who am I will tell us the user that we're currently logged in as. And now you can pretty much type any command you want onto the target machine that you just connected to. Bind shells require you to be able to set up a listener on the target before you can issue any commands to it. This will typically have to be done through some sort of command execution exploit. Bind shells are more susceptible to being blocked by firewalls because the initiation for any connection comes from the attacking machine, typically outside of the target's internal network. It is much more likely that a firewall will block a random incoming connection than an outgoing one, especially if the outgoing connection is made to a commonly allowed port like port 443, which is the default port for HTTPS. This is where reverse shells come in. Reverse shells are the bread and butter of RCE payloads, and for good reason. With a reverse shell, the listener is set up on your attacking machine, like your Kali VM, and the connection is initiated from your target. This is typically done through an exploit that allows command execution in order to send the request to connect to our listener. Since the connection initiates from the target computer, it is much less likely to be blocked by a firewall, but reverse shells can still be blocked by anti-malware programs if not obfuscated properly. We can get a list of different basic reverse shells by looking at Swiss Chi Repo's reverse shell cheat sheet. 
Here we can see we can generate reverse shells using multiple different languages and other programs. Another cheat sheet site that we can use for reverse shells is pentestmonkey.net, which will give us some of the more common basic reverse shells that we can use during our penetration tests and capture the flags. Something that was mentioned a little earlier that we can use to generate our reverse shells is revshells.com. Here we can choose the IP address and port that we'll be listening on on our Kali machine, the type of listener that we want to set up, in most cases it will be netcat, as well as the program or language we want a reverse shell to be in, and it will be automatically generated for us. For example, let's generate a Linux reverse shell using netcat. We'd first input the IP address of our Kali box, in our case 192.168.1.101, and then I will select the listening port of 8002. We can make sure our operating system is set to Linux, and then select the NCMKFIFO option to see a one-liner that we can copy and paste to get our reverse shell. Unlike bind shells, this time we have to set up our listener first on our Kali machine by typing nc-lvnp and then the port that we wanted to listen on, in our case 8002, and hit enter. To demonstrate a command execution vulnerability that allow us to execute our reverse shell, we can use the dvwa command execution exercise. Basically here we have an input bar that wants us to put in an IP address to ping for free. So if we put in the IP address of our Kali machine and hit submit, after a few seconds we see that we'll get a ping back, and it looks like this command is being executed in a terminal, so we can escape the ping command by typing a semicolon, and then pasting in our reverse shell, and then once we hit submit, if we check back to our Kali listener, we see that we have our reverse shell up and running, and we can type whatever commands we want on the machine that's running the web server. If our target doesn't have netcat installed on it, almost all modern Linux distributions come pre-installed with Python 3, so we can select any one of the Python 3 reverse shell options to generate a reverse shell using Python. For this example, let's select Python 3 number 2, and it will give us a one-liner that we can run on our target. So back on our Kali box, make sure that we have our listener running. And then on our target Linux system, we can paste the Python one-liner and hit enter. And back on our Kali box, we see that we have command execution. To demonstrate a reverse shell on Windows, we can select any one of the PowerShell options to spawn a reverse shell using Windows PowerShell. PowerShell option number one is going to require you to have a PowerShell console to run your payload in, and PowerShell option two just requires regular CMD command execution. PowerShell option three, base64, is going to encode the payload using base64 to try and obfuscate the commands a little bit, but modern anti-malware systems and competent SOC teams should still be able to pick them up. If we were to run any of these basic shells on a Windows system today, they would get picked up by Defender Antivirus. So we're going to have to disable real-time protection for this demonstration. Here I've copied the PowerShell option number three into a CMD prompt, and once we hit enter, we should have a reverse shell on our Windows system where we can type in any Windows commands back on our target. Here again, we've CD'd onto the Windows user desktop and listed out their files. If you want a Windows reverse shell that can bypass Defender, there are many GitHub tools and blogs that talk about bypassing Defender, but it would take too long to explain in this video. And I fear the video might get taken down if I go too in depth, so for now, we're gonna stick to the basics. If our target is running a PHP web server that allows for file uploads, we may be able to upload a PHP reverse shell and access it to gain remote code execution that way. Back on the reverse shell generator, we can use the PHP pentest monkey option to create a PHP reverse shell file that specifies our IP address and port of our listener. We can copy this script and save it to a file like shell.php, or in my case, local.php. In this file, we can upload to a PHP web server, and if we can access it, we may be able to establish a reverse shell connection. So over on this DVWA vulnerable web server, we do have a file upload option here. So let's go ahead and upload that local.php file that we created earlier. Select upload. We can make sure our listener is running on our Kali machine. And then if we access this URL here where the PHP file was uploaded and hit enter, it looks like the web server is stalled out. But if we go back to our terminal, we see that we've established a reverse shell on the web server. Depending on what else is installed on our target, we could get a reverse shell using Perl, C Sharp, JavaScript, Java, or even create an exe or L file that will give us the reverse shell. And we'll go over how to create the exe and L files a little later in the video. Sometimes when we're attacking a web server, we may have the ability to write files to the website, which gives us the option to insert a web shell. A web shell is an interactive shell written in a programming language that can be accessed via the target's website, such as PHP or ASPX. If we discover a vulnerability that allows us to upload a file and have it accessible via the web server, we can upload a web shell and be able to execute commands via a web interface. If the web server is running PHP as its backend language, we can start by running a basic PHP script that will give us command execution by typing the following one-liner. We can save this one-line PHP script to a file like basic.php. Once we upload this file to our web server and find out where the uploaded files go in the web directory, 
We can then access our web shell and execute commands by adding to our URL question mark cmd equals and then the command we want to execute. For example, we can append question mark cmd equals who am I to the basic PHP file that we uploaded and hit enter and we see that we're running as the user www-data. From this web shell, we can execute any basic commands like we could from a reverse shell or a bind shell. And from here, we can even pivot to a reverse shell by putting one of the one-liners that we used earlier in the video into this URL. This web shell is very basic, and there are more sophisticated ones that exist that give us more options, like the White Winter Wolf PHP web shell. You can get the web shell for yourself at the White Winter Wolf GitHub, and here I'm going to set it up locally so we can take a look at it. So this is the White Winter Wolf web shell, and as we can see, it's a bit more complicated than the one that we submitted earlier. Now we have the option to set our current working directory, the ability to upload files, and a separate input field to type out longer commands. For example, let's set our current working directory to the Kali desktop, and issue the ls command to list out what's on that directory. And as you can see, we have all of the files that are on my Kali desktop, and we can even type out present working directory to show you that we are on the home Kali desktop. And there are plenty of other PHP web shells that exist out there, so you can find the one that is best for you. If you come across a web server that is running Microsoft ASP.NET as its backend language, then we can use the Antac web shell located at user share nasheng Antac web shell, and the file will be called antac.aspx. This web shell allows us to put a password on the shell before we can execute any commands, upload and download files, and encode and execute programs, or even execute SQL queries. If you open up the file in a text editor, here's where you would set your username and password to access the web shell. And I don't currently have a Microsoft ASP.NET web server running at the moment, so I'll show some screenshots of what the web shell actually looks like. When looking for exploits to use against a known vulnerability, one of the first places hackers and penetration testers will check is Metasploit. If you don't know what Metasploit is, it's a penetration testing framework developed by Rapid7. One of its main features is being able to run hundreds of different exploits for known vulnerabilities using pre-built exploits called modules. These modules allow us to select a payload that will be executed once the exploit is successful, and many of these payloads include different kinds of shells. For example, if you were running an exploit on a Windows system, like Eternal Blue, we could choose the payload Windows X64 Meterpreter Reverse TCP to establish a reverse Meterpreter shell. A Meterpreter shell is a special kind of shell that works with Metasploit modules that grants you more features than a regular reverse shell, and it also has the ability to completely be ran in memory. Other common Windows payloads in Metasploit are Windows X64 Meterpreter Reverse HTTPS, for a reverse Meterpreter shell over HTTPS, and Windows X64 Shell Reverse TCP for just a basic reverse shell. If you're exploiting a Linux machine, we can use the payload Linux x86 Meterpreter Reverse TCP for a reverse Meterpreter shell, or Linux x86 Shell Reverse TCP for a normal reverse TCP shell. On macOS, we can use OS X x86 Meterpreter Reverse TCP for a Meterpreter shell, or OS X x86 Shell Underscore Reverse Underscore TCP for a regular reverse shell. If you aren't using an exploit in Metasploit, but want to create the payloads that will grant us a Meterpreter shell, we can use MSF Venom to do so. For example, if we wanted to create a Windows executable that gave us a Meterpreter reverse shell, we can use this command to do so. The dash p argument is going to specify the payload that we want to set up, in our case Windows x64 Meterpreter reverse TCP, and we set the local host to the listener IP address, in our case 192.168.1.101, and then our listener port of 8888. We can select the format as executable, and we're going to save all of this to shell.exe. So we can hit enter. And now we see that shell.exe has been created, and we can drop this on a Windows system and run it to get our reverse shell. But before we do that, in order to catch this reverse shell when it's executed, we need to use the handler module in Metasploit. To do this, we first have to launch Metasploit by typing in MSF console. Then we're going to type use exploit multi handler. Then we're going to set the payload to the one that we use in our MSF Venom command. Set the local host to your listener IP address, and set the listener port to your listening port, and then type run. With our shell.exe program on our Windows system, once we run it, and select run anyway, we see back on our listener that we have a Meterpreter shell, and we can type help to list out all of the different commands that Meterpreter has to offer. Some notable commands include being able to run additional Meterpreter modules, being able to upload and download files to and from your target machine, as well as a bunch of other standard file system commands, the ability to steal impersonation tokens, shut down the computer, attempt to escalate your privileges, send keystrokes or start recording keystrokes like a keylogger, watch the user's desktop in real time, take screenshots, record the microphone or webcam, play audio files on the target system, or even dump the SAM database if it's a Windows system. If we want to drop into a regular shell, we can just type in shell into our Meterpreter command line, and now we have a standard Windows shell that acts like a normal Windows reverse shell. 
If we want to do the same thing on Linux, we can create a reverse interpreter shell in Python or PHP, or we can use the Linux equivalent of an exe file called an elf file. To do this, we can issue a similar msf venom command. This time for our payload, we're going to specify Linux x86 interpreter reverse TCP, specify our listener IP address and port, and for the format, we're going to use elf, and then write all of this data to shell.elf. And then once again in MSF console, we have to set up our handler for the reverse shell connection. So we're going to be using the exploit multi-handler module, this time setting our payload to the Linux x86 interpreter reverse TCP that we set in the MSF Venom command line, and then set the IP address and port to our listener that we use in the MSF Venom command line as well. We can type run again to start that listener, copy over that shell.l file to our Ubuntu target, make the shell file executable by doing chmod plus x shell.elf, and now all we have to do is run the elf file by doing a dot slash shell dot elf. And we should receive another interpreter shell back on our Kali virtual machine. All right, that's it for this video on shells and payloads. If you enjoyed or found this video useful, please leave a like because it helps out the channel a lot and subscribe for more cybersecurity content. If you want to talk about cybersecurity, feel free to leave a comment or join my discord to reach me and the rest of the community. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. See ya.